So they're wind generators. They are, they are the plug. <laughs> Don't worry, they might as well because they're sucking energy out of the economy. So, yeah. Well, I guess we don't have a quorum. We don't have to sing. We'll, we'll, we'll get more as they wind in. Um, we are at a – yeah, cookies are gone. <laughs> and a coffee, right? We are at an astounding peak because, you know, we've seen a Samaritan woman who is so astounding that Jesus takes his time that he apparently – we're going to see even more of this – that he apparently doesn't take the time – with the disciples, or that, or they're just so stupid and obtuse, they don't get it, right? But yet, he speaks candidly with a Samaritan woman, which I think is astounding, which, by the way, again, go back. The, the gospel itself said, Sikhar, these people are drunken workers, and they're not supposed to be smart. They're supposed to be kind of the dredges of society, and, you know, they even, you know, uh, that's a claim made, right? And yet we see last week that Jesus declared himself to be the Messiah. Except it was declared not, it was, he declared it directly, ego imi, but the one who made the statement was a Samaritan woman. She said, you, you know, we're looking for the Messiah. We're looking for the Christ. She said both, the Hebrew and the Greek, and then Jesus said, Ego in me. I am the Christ. I am the Messiah, which ought to, uh, you know, um, are you convinced, right? The whole thing in Greek is about a logical argument to convince you. So are you convinced? G Most Greeks would say, Okay, first of all, if you make a claim like this, you know, um, this is a pretty ast astounding claim. Ego imi, I am, right? But uh, anyway, what, hey, did you, did you draw, mark out the 20th? Yes, I did because we hadn't taken a vote yet. Hey, but the 20th, we, we were planning to be rebels. Don't listen, okay, don't. I'm going to put it up on the internet. I guess we're being rebels. Okay, well. You guys want to, you guys want to have class on the 20th? Yeah. Okay. Okay, well, if we get kicked out into the parking lot. Yeah, <laughs> it's your fault. It'll be a little cold. Well, okay, we get the impression that when he said it in Mark, the way he said it. Now, we get the Greek, right? And usually we, here's a really interesting thing. If Jesus said, I am, like Yahweh, in Mark, but our writers are Greek, we would expect them to do one of two things. Either quote Jesus when he said Yahweh, or for them to translate it into Greek, which is what, you know, the thing is this. We know that in general, Jesus was speaking Greek, and we can see that. However, in Mark, which is a very interesting text in itself, okay, did he say Yahweh, and the translator, or the, not the, the, the hearers, not write that on purpose because they knew that in Greek it was a very similar kind of statement, right? Or did he say ego imi and they were just so astounded by his confession or his statement that they fell on their face? In this case, in John, we have the impression that no, they didn't, they weren't primed like they might be right about the temple or about Yahweh, but rather. His statement of ego imi has a similar import in Greek itself. So, again, you know, this is why I say all the time, we want to look at the Gospels as if they are, uh, we call, matter of fact, we didn't. The Turbingen School called them synoptic because they were looking for Q, right? 
But as we've studied the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, we find they are not synoptic. They, they share some attributes, but when we looked at them specifically, we saw that they are not really synoptic. They're not, they're not intended to... They do not come from the same source, Q. They came from people's hearts and minds in the time, and they were writing down a logos to telos in Greek to prove a point, right? To make a logos to telos, an unstated telos. And by the way, they're really good at it because we don't, we, when we looked at Matthew, Mark, and Luke before, we didn't see a whole lot of, of telos, right? They just didn't give it to us. And Mark is just totally that way. You know, you stupid disciples. And they ask him, Jesus, Jesus, tell us. And Jesus goes, okay, I'll tell you. And he tells him again, and it's like, wait, wait, you didn't improve, right? And the, the disciples like, well, we still don't really understand, but we'll act like we do, right? You, can you see this? So Mark, or, or this is why I say John is astounding in the Roman character of the document. Because we get this, we get some state and tell us, which is astounding, right? We saw it already, right? Ego emi. We look, we're looking for the Messiah, and we're looking for, we're looking for uh, the Christ. Wow, this woman is so smart that she knows about the Messiah, the Hebrew Messiah, and she knows about the Christ. And Jesus goes, I go in. Wow. You know, that is a telos. And we don't usually get a stated telos in Greek. So, we, we, you know, even... The Romans are going, yeah, now we understand. The Greeks are going, no, you really shouldn't do that, right? But they're probably still happy because they're like, now I don't have to tease it out. Just say it. That's the way, that's the way you could be thinking about this. But anyway, you know, I think that's a really interesting and dynamic question because, you know, they were, they did show that in Mark when he said that. When he said specifically ego emi, it looks like he may have said a Hebrew word, but yet, you know, he spoke Greek. And we know he spoke Greek because most of the time they translated. I suspect they did not translate it into Yahweh because you're not supposed to write that, right? Anyway, it, you know, this gets kind of, this gets really big. This kind of stuff, this is really the stuff of mystery and, you know, digging, right? Anyway, so the, Disciples return. This we started, and I think I went through this just a little bit, but let's go ahead. I just remind you, we looked at the translation, and, and on this came his disciples, and they wondered because he was uttering words with a married woman. Not even one indeed said, what do you seek to worship? Or why do you utter words in company with her? Um... Pamela was asked about this, and, you know, the, the thing is that they probably saw her coming to the well, and they probably made fun of her, and then when, she, when they were coming back, they probably heard some of the discussion or conversation, and are like, you know, maybe they're hurrying their steps up, uh, but still, she, she's more conversant than they are, and we're going to see this. Interesting. Uh, this implication, they heard part of the conversation because, you know, in the Greek, it's what do you seek to worship, not not why are you, you know, here, uh, but why do you utter words in company with her? So they heard her, them speaking. And as we know, when it says in Greek that they, you know, a lego, they were making a logical argument that they were conversing. We just get the telos, we get the end part of the conversation. Um, further implication is good. Why does it say not even one indeed said? Not even one indeed. That's just the Greek. Not a single one of them. You could say in in common English, we could say not 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 a single one or not even one, but not even one indeed. Indeed, uh, Greek does not have very many embellishments. So when they have the embellishments, I want you to see them. That's the opposite of what the uh, other versions said. Let's see, the other versions. Here's the King James. Um, yet no man said, what seekest thou? Or why talkest thou with her? Yet no, and the NIV is similar. You know, 
They weren't. <laughs> they weren't curious. Actually, they were. It sounds like they were curious, but for some reason they didn't. They're like, I'm not going to ask about that. Yes, sir. Well, the word "indeed" implies you would expect that they would do this, mm -hmm. but they didn't, and that's yeah. surprising. So. See, this this is why. Okay, I I'm not going to go back over the whole cultural thing again, but this is this is literally a clash of culture. Because the Samaritan woman obviously has a very, very strong, what kind of character? Greek character, right? She is asking questions. Remember, Greeks, the Socratic method is what? You ask questions and you draw the information out of your students. The Greek method is to ask questions. The rabbinic method is what? It's really silent learning, silent learning. So you sit with your rabbi, do you ask him any questions? Never, you're never allowed to ask a question of the rabbi. You sit and you listen. And you, you, until, you have, until you have memorized the Torah, the Tanakh, the uh, Mishnah, and the commentary to the Mishnah, you are not even allowed to make a sound. Finally, after 40 years, you know, after however long, and you have memorized all this, and the rabbi, as a matter of fact, you, you can see this, because what happens? The rabbi might acknowledge you. They're not gonna ask you a question. The rabbi will make a statement, and he'll look at you, and maybe it's Paul, right? Saul. So? We talked about the problem of someone in a well on sun, on Saturday, on the Shabbat, the Shabbat. And this is what the rabbis said. That's a Mishnah. So what does he expect Saul to then do? Elaborate on it. Exactly. And that, by the way, the one, the one who shall not be named is actually... A statement in the Mishnah. The Mishnah has some quotes from He Shu Shall Not Be Named, which we believe was Saul of Tarsus, Paul. So we call him Paul, but Saul of Tarsus he had a Greek, he had a Roman, uh, a Hebrew name Saul, and he had a Greek name Paul. And we believe that they struck him out because he was he who shall not be named is not Voldemort. It was good old Paul. Because they did not, they liked his argument. They did not want to attribute it. Which is really interesting. You know, be really fun. I don't think I want to spend 40 years learning to be a rabbi, you know, an Orthodox rabbi and, and memorizing all that stuff. I mean, that would probably be good for our, our hearts and souls. But to be able to get to the point where you could finally make a commentary on, on Paul. <laughs> well, most of us are like the Samaritan woman. We're not like the disciples. And, you know, they say you should be like the disciples. Well, maybe I'm not so sure about that because the disciples really messed up lots of times, right? So be like the Samaritan woman. Anyway, we're getting more. So then leaving her water jar, the woman went back to the town and said to the people, because, and the reason she did this is because Jesus said to her, let's see, uh, let's see, the previous statement, okay, this was this statement, I'm probably messing up my video here, because uh, I got my face in it, um, <laughs> let's see, get stuck, um, where is that, he's, he, he tells her to bring her man. Where is that? Where does he tell her to bring her man? Anyway, I skipped it. I missed it. Uh, maybe if you're looking at it, verse 16. Verse 16? Yeah, that far back? Yeah. Go call your husband and come back. Yeah. That's, you know, we're looking at that statement. Uh, I, he says, go get your husband to come hither. Um, makes the logic trying to lead, lead under 
emit a sound, call your man, and come, come within this place. And then they have their little discussion about the Messiah, which is a beautiful discussion. And then the disciples come back and scare her away. <clears throat> Literally. She then leaving her water jar. She didn't want to speak to the disciples either. <laughs> right? I, yeah, th this just is almost okay. We do never appreciate the comedy. There is comedy in all these documents. The Greeks are full of beautiful comedy, irony, satire. Hebrew really has some great comedy. You know, is it a funny thing that a lot of uh, comedians are Hebrew are Jewish Hebrew? You know, have you noticed that? You know, they have this unstated kind of or under underwhelming kind of thing where they state stuff. Uh, you know, even Seinfeld, like Seinfeld, right? These people are all comedians. Well, you think it's in there? It is in there. It's all in there. It's deep in there. Greek Greeks were not ha 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 laugh out loud kind of people. Greeks are more the kind of subtle humor kind of folks that. You know, kind of like, okay, you know, and so this is, this is not, this is, this is kind of an ironic joke. So Jesus told her, go bring your man. The disciples come. They're not, they're not going to ask her even a question. And then she goes, then leaving your water jar, the woman went back to town and said to the people, and let's see what it says in the Greek. Here's it, King James. The woman left her water pot and went away to the city and said to the men. Okay, she went forth, she sent forth accordingly the water jar of her, the married woman, and she went off to or into the Poland, the town, and she makes a logical argument to the human. That's basically it. To the humans or men. According to the married woman, set for, sent forth her water jar, and she went off into the town, and she makes a logical argument to the people. She trusted Jesus and the disciples. She probably trusted Jesus more than the disciples, but she left her water jar, obviously, with probably Jesus, figuring, but I think you're right. Because a water jar, all right, you know, okay. I know we got pots and pans. We got pots everywhere. You got, I got pots in front of my house. I mean, they're great, right? And if the pot breaks, they'll go buy a new one because they're cheap. They're not cheap. They're not cheap. They cost... I don't know what the cost of the, you know, this is a real problem. You, you do see this. Um, one of the great things about role playing that has happened is role playing made people common, normal people like us, you know, regular people. They don't even study history. Go back and look at, for example, costs of things because it's really fun in role playing. Let's say you do role playing in medieval or whatever people do Dungeons and Dragons and things like that. They make up their own um, currencies. They make up their own stuff. But the really realistic ones wanted to go back and look at what, what did it cost in a medieval time or cost in the Renaissance era for a sword or armor or horse and then apply them. So believe it or not, there are bodies of people who actually know these things and have looked these things up and have researched this stuff. So you can actually find it to some degree today. Where if no one had asked the question, it'd be on a yeah, it'd be on an esoteric paper. Right? For me to find for me to find papers that told me about how much stuff costs, it's better to look on Amazon today to see how much a uh, a Torah scroll costs fifty thousand dollars. You can go find <coughs> evidence that that are similar, but then you have to correct it for inflation and all other stuff. It, guess what? You find it's about fifty thousand dollars for a Torah scroll back in the day. But people didn't record this information. There's a lot of papers. But we find, you know, how much did it cost? Was it denarius? You know? Yes, sir. I'm kind of curious. The, the term she sent forth her water jar was, implies she had somebody else take it on to where she was going with it instead of leaving it behind. Confusing. Yeah, it, that's just kind of the Greek. Um, you know, sent forth. In other words, she, she put it someplace. You know, 
you can, what can you gather from this? You could gather a lot of stuff. Did she hide it? Did she put it behind the well? Did she give it to Jesus? Did she hand it to one of the disciples? Probably not. Yeah, who was going to take this? <laughs> you know, get back, right? You know, what did she do? She did something with it. And, but the thing is, it's interesting is that she, she, I don't know, it probably wasn't full, which is good, but it's, it's a valuable thing to her. This is a very valuable piece, right? Which the word seems to have similar meaning and spelling to apostle, the word for apostle, to send out or whatever it is. That, I, can, I didn't, I did not look to Maybe see, really but it could be, you know, in, in Greek, Apostolos in Greek, um, apostolos means uh, not to be sent, uh, rather to be um, a mess. Well, a messenger sent, yeah, it's similar. So, if nothing else, it's interesting that they felt the need to mention. I mean, they're not going to take the time to break out the arguments, and they just say that they're he. He put out a logical argument, but they didn't expand on it. But here they point out the fact that she left her water jar. It probably, it probably means she was in a hurry because otherwise she would have to take it home and then go. Right. She was like, oh my gosh, i got to tell people about this. You can't just leave it around. Yeah, you have to come yeah, I, I just think it was an indication of how excited she was mm -hmm. to get back and report this. Mm -hmm. I do too. That she wanted to move quickly. And also, okay, your choice. Okay, here's your choices. I can leave it here. These disciples might steal it, but I could leave it here, right? Um, but pe how much you want to bet every person knows her water jug? I mean, when people have very limited kind of ownership of things, you know, the things they have are really critical to them, and everybody knows you have them, right? So everybody knew it was hers. So she didn't want to leave it on the road, and she didn't want to leave it on the marketplace, and, you know, she wanted to move quickly. So, yeah, I think that's probably a good way of thinking, uh, thinking about it. But what really is interesting to me is, saith to the men, no, she made a logical argument to the anthropos, okay, and I know we say, you know, anthropon, anthropos can be to men, but it's also women. So to translate it as just men is not really correct. It's to the humans, to the, to the people there. But she made a logical argument to them. And, and you can imagine this culturally too, right? So who does she, who can she approach in her culture? Women. Women, exactly. So she went to the marketplace probably where the disciples had just been, right? And she approaches the women. And the women are listening. Can you see this picture? I mean, I wish we could make a movie of this because you could see this. She's talking to the women, and then all of a sudden the women are like talking to the men, and the men are talking to the women, and everybody is now talking about it. And let's see what happens. In the end, he says, Come, see a man who told me everything I ever did. Could this be the Messiah? And this, of course, is going to be beautiful. Come see a man which told me all things I ever did. Is this not the Christ? Okay. <laughs> so what did she say? You come hither, you stare at a man face, a man, who he said to me, all the whole I made or did, whether at all this is the Christus, the Christ. She's speaking to them in Greek. Did she make a statement or did she ask a question? No, she, ar she, she, she argued. She, she, she made a logical argument to them. So the, the, her argument was, you stare at a man who said to me, everything as much as I did, whether at all, this is the Christ. In other words, okay, you come hither. You stare at a man who said to me, everything as much as I did, whether at all this is the Christ. Well, still, the fact that she's a Samaritan woman addressing the crowd, is, is that a taboo situation? Or 
Well, they're all Samaritans. Oh, they're all. They're all well. Well, the impression we have is they're Samaritans. There may be some Greeks in there mixed in. There may be some Hebrews who know, you know, kicked out of, of the Hebrew areas. I don't know. You know, they probably have all kinds of. Remember, they call this the workers area, the area of drunkards, right? And they consider them to be not bright. And they're, but we we know they're the they're the peak of the DNA for the Hebrew people, right? For the Jewish people. So uh, that's probably not a very good enjoiner, right? But in any case. She's speaking to the crowd, and what is interesting is, Kate, you notice I didn't put a question mark. The, the thing is, they said, is, this not, is not this the Christ? But that's not really what she says. She makes a statement, you stare at a man who said to me everything as much as I did, bang, that's it. Whether at all this is the Christ. In other words, she, she didn't ask him a question. What did she do? You come and decide for yourself. Yeah, she well, she presented to them the logical argument, and then she gets she she gives them this this statement. Okay, she gets, she says whether all this is the Christ. In other words, you know, here I, I talked to him. Here's what he said. You know, yes, there is an applied question here, but the specifics are this is what he told me. Right, so. Basically, make up your own logical argument. Make up your own decision. Make, convince yourself. She's basically saying she's convinced. Okay, oh, let's see. Um, they came out of the town and made their way toward him. So, okay. How convincing was she? She gave a, okay. All right. Number one, we have this woman who is so smart that Jesus is want, wants to talk, will talk to her. Talk to her in ways he never talked to Nicodemus, nor to the disciples. Okay? And he expressed to her, this is, okay, who, who said he was the Messiah before? I already asked you this question last week. Who said he was the Messiah before? John the Baptist said he was the Messiah before. That was his witness. This is the first time that Jesus has stated that he is the Messiah. And guess who he makes his announcement to? A Samaritan woman. Well, we don't know. But see, this is a question we had, which I think is very interesting. I, I don't know, I think maybe talking to Rick about it. I can't remember what I was talking about. But is this, is she the norm? Is she above the norm, or is she below the norm? And what I mean by that is, okay, is it common for people to have five husbands because of death or whatever, right? Maybe, probably not. You know, we get the impression that this is not unique, but it's different, right? Even from the gospel, that gives us that impression. But we don't know. We don't know. In my family, both my grandmothers or grand, you know, my my parent, my grandparents, they had a family first, and the wife died after having a number of children, um, and then married another, and then had ten children in one case. The other case had three children, but they were, you know, that was really common. I don't think that my grandparents lost. I I don't know if they lost <coughs> children. You know, they didn't talk about these things much in that era. It just happened. They'd lose children, right? And we know, going back to the Victorian era, we know about a few people, famous people. You know, they lost children willy-nilly. You know, typhus, cholera, you name it. You know, most families lost at least one or two children in their families. That's really rare and odd today. But it was common in that day. So, you know, I don't know. It, you know, I would suspect this woman is, is different in some ways. But yet, here we have a super perceptive, obviously pretty well educated for her time. I wish we knew how she was educated. I wish we knew if she came from a family of priests. Of Samaritan priests or, or something. Or, something, or maybe. There had to be a way she got it. Yeah, yes, sir. Well, if she was at the well midday, 
the implication is that she was some sort of outcast, right? She was, yes. Okay. But for her to rush to the marketplace enthusiastically starting to talk to people who <laughs> would be shunning her, right. right, would have attracted their attention and said, you know, yeah. this must have been something very extraordinary for her to even do this, and it must have made an impression on them. Well, we got to see what she's talking about. If she never would have, we didn't even talk to this woman. I think that's exactly correct. As a matter of fact, let's put on our, our Greek, Greek, let's put on our pelopos, right, so we can think Greek. And if we think Greek, this woman, okay, what, what would make the Greeks most happy about any of us? Is that we could make what? A logical, a, logical a logical argument. And so no matter what or who this woman was, as a matter of fact, in the Greek worldview, if she can articulate and make a logical argument to anyone and convince them, what, where is she on the Greek scale? Yeah, she is the peak. And I believe, okay, we're, we're not, we are Greek thinkers, but we don't think this way, right? But we should, because this lady, whoever she was, whatever her foundations of her life was, she was able to go to the marketplace. She was able to convince the town such that we get this reaction. They went out of the city and came unto him. They went out and came out from out among of the uh, Peleos of a town, and they were coming or going forward to him. They came out from the town, and they were coming forward to him. In the Greek. Basic, straight-out statement, right? Um, okay. <laughs> and then... <laughs> Meanwhile. Meanwhile, the disciples. Okay. <laughs> okay. Well, really, you know, you, you've got to, okay, you got to see this is a little Greek irony here. The Greeks, like I told you, there is comedy in this. And we miss all the beautiful comedy. You can see it right here. Here's Seinfeld. They came out, okay. Meanwhile, the disciples urged him, Rabbi, eat something. Okay. What are you, my mother? You know, is it, is it my mother? Hey, come on, eat something. I got something for you. Crack me up. Anyway, so they, here's in the King James. And in the meanwhile, the disciples prayed him, saying, Master, eat. All right. Now, this is really interesting. In the betwixt, in the in betwixt, they were asking him, the disciples, <coughs> making a logical argument to him. Okay, I think this is really important. Rabbi Fidget, eat. Rabbi eat. In the betwixt, in the betwixt, the disciples were asking him, make a logic argument, Rabbi eat. Okay, betwixt what? Well, here's here's Jesus, <laughs> here's the disciples, and then here's what? The crowd with the woman coming up to the well. So in the betwixt, here's the disciples. And they're like, hey, you know, they're, they're arguing with him, okay? Why don't you eat something? Look, lunchtime. Lunchtime. well, we went, we went to the market, and we got you something to eat. You know, we got some pastrami here, got some, you know, liverwurst. Come on, here's something. Come on, here, eat it, right? Eat it. Give up your spree. <laughs> you know, talk, talk, totally, you know, it's about the important things in life, right? They just heard this discussion of something, and they're asking. Well, culturally, too, what do we know about this culture? You need to eat when you can, like starvation culture. Well, it's starvation culture, but what about master, what about rabbi versus the, the followers? We don't follow this in the modern era, but the military does. And so do you do it if you go to see... The king of England now, the queen's dead. But if you see the king, or you see the queen, you have to do this. Do you sit before the queen? Do you sit before your commanding officer? The commanding officer sits first. The commanding officer, you don't do it. Matter of fact, I don't know if you know military decorum. How many times do you knock on a door? Once. One knock. That's all you're allowed. The commander says, you may enter. You come in her, you salute, you present yourself to the commander, the commander, 
your attention, he might say, you know, at rest, at ease, take a seat. If he stands, you don't sit until after he sits. This is military. It's the way it works. It's the way it works. It's supposed to work in all aristocratic, you know, hierarchical systems. Therefore, do you eat before your rabbi? So what? They are They want to eat. They want to eat. What are we standing around for? We got the pastrami right here and we want to make a pastrami sandwich, right? So let's break it out. Come on, let's eat. And they're making a logical argument to him. I think it's hilarious. Uh, he said to them, now this is a really interesting statement. I have food to eat that you know nothing about. You notice he didn't say, let's see what it says in the Greek. He said to them in the King James, I have meat to eat that you know nothing of. Of course, meat means in, in the uh, King James means provision, food. In the Greek it says, Diva Epin, he said, he said, so he, he didn't make a logical argument. He said this to them. To them, this is a quote. I should put it in quotes. Brosin, I have eating, I have eating, I hold Bajan to eat that you know or not stare at. You don't look at. He said to them, I have eating, I hold to eat, which you do not stare at. I have eating, I hold to eat, which you don't stare at. And because it says he epin, this is a quote. This is a direct quote from Christ. So I have eating, I hold to eat, which you don't stare at. This is a euphemistic statement. This is a very deep euphemistic statement. In Greek, the Greeks would probably go what? Ah, you know, this is not your classical Greek. What would the Romans say? Same thing we would. I get it. I understand it. You know, and of course, the Greeks, if you explained it to them, what would they say? Oh, cool, right? You know, I can get this, but it's still euphemistic. That's, again, why I say these documents, John specifically, is very heavily Roman thinking with the Greek. It's in Greek, but it's got some really strong Roman elements. So why didn't the disciples in Hebrew, wouldn't it have been the same kind of meaning as the Romans would have, like euphemistically? Yes. Yes. They should. Well, let's see what they say. You know, this is always, and then the disciples said to each other, okay, 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 all right. So this shows you what they're thinking. The disciples said to each other, could someone have brought them food? Okay. Again, this is, this is comedy routine, okay. Therefore, said the disciples one to another, have any man brought him ought to eat? You, you notice in the King James says, ask one another. Let's see what it says in the Greek. They were making a logical argument accordingly. The learners, for to one another, they didn't talk to Jesus about this, is to each other. May or not, not or least, some or any <coughs> person or object did carry to him to eat. According to the disciples, were making a logical argument, forward to one another, lest someone did carry to him to eat. And by the way, someone did carry to him to eat. This, this is a beautiful Greek, both a telos. And an irony. It, it doesn't, it's not a stated tell us, it's an unstated tell us. Why is that? It's a logical argument. Who gave him something to eat? The Samaritan woman. Yeah. So the disciples are what kind of thinkers? They're Greek thinkers, they're concrete thinkers. They do not have enough of the Hebrew stink on them, right? Even though they're Hebrews. And by the way, we knew that because most of their names are You know, these are all indicators, cultural indicators to us. Beautiful stuff. Um, my food, said Jesus, is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. Uh, let's look at in the Greek, and then you tell me what the unstated tell us is to this. This is a beautiful unstated tell us. Oh, it got stuck. I don't know why it gets stuck on that stuff, but it does Jesus said to them, my meat is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. He makes a logical argument to them, Jesus, my broma, my food, is 
in order that I should make or do the thelema, a determination or act of will of the pimp santos, having sent me, and <coughs> teleoso, teleoso, telesta, teleos, telos, I should complete of him the ergon, the toil. Jesus makes a large argument to them. My food is that I should make the determination and act of will of him, having sent me, and I should complete his toil. <coughs> complete, okay, telos, it's telos. What is the telos? Who, who, who allowed him to complete his toil? Um, who gave him the food? In other words, she is the one who allowed him to complete his toil. In other words, she is acting what? In the will of God. This is really, okay. You know, I, I know we don't, you know, we don't really get in this, like, depth of this really cool stuff. But just look at what Jesus is saying. The disciples said, hey, eat some food. He goes, I got food that you don't know about. You know, I I have the eat of the eating that you don't, I have the eating of the eat, eat that you don't know about. And, he, and they go, well, what is it, right, basically? And he goes, my food, what I eat, is that I should make a determinate act of will of him having sent me of God, and I should complete his toil. And by the way, who gave him the food? The Samaritan woman. So, amidst all this is this wonderful logical argument. When I when we get done with chapter uh, this chapter, I'll give you an outline and give you the arguments, the logos to tell us arguments, so you can see them like in a comprehensive way. But this this is not your. This is not just a little historical venue. It's not a story about the Samaritan woman. It's not a story about Jesus' disciples. This is an act of Logos to tell us that, that I believe, I think, believe. I am convinced this Logos to tell us not only happened, it happened exactly the way John tells us it happened, but John wants us not to miss the point. Right? Jesus doesn't want us to miss the point. I would argue that Jesus' whole life was a Logos to tell us. And our lives should be a Logos to tell us. As a matter of fact, if you're making the mark, right, if you're aiming for the mark, even if you don't hit it, your mark should be that I live my life as a Logos to tell us. It may be an unstated tell us. I'm, I'm, I'm kind of, kind of straight away here a little bit, but the big deal is this is your life. You may not be recognized for all the great things that you've done. Maybe you will. Maybe you're a celebrity who's recognized for doing hardly anything, right? Except maybe or acting on stage or whatever, or you know, or doing bad things. Yes, you can be recognized for really bad things, which is not a good idea because when you go to talk to Jesus about it, I don't think it's very positive. But the big deal is this, you know, this is life. This really is life. The, your life is a Logos to tell us. And by the way, the food, okay, you know, the Greeks are big into this. The Romans are big into this. We're big into this. The Hebrews are big into this. Okay? If you think about it, what, uh, even Jesus said it. Okay? What about bread? Right? Build, make this into bread. And he said, the Father in heaven, right? The bread is obeying the Father, and not eating. You know, the, your, your power, your, your life comes from it. The Greeks would say, hey, that's a very radical statement there. The Romans would say, we'll get it. We say, we get it. The Hebrews say, we get it, right? So anyway, we are, our Greek and, and, and Roman minds. And here's what, this is, <laughs> this is really interesting stuff. Okay. Don't you have a saying? This is Jesus. Don't you have a saying, it's still four months until harvest. I tell you, open your eyes and look at the fields. They are ripe for harvest. Um, all right. You've probably never been explained this. 
And you may have wondered what this meant. Say not, there are four, four months, and then cometh the harvest. Behold, I say unto you, lift up your eyes and look at the fields, for they are white already to harvest. Okay? Oh, nor not, I miss you, legete, make a logical argument, that or because, even now, at four months is kai, and the therismos, the reaping, it comes or goes. You look at, I make a logical argument to you, you rise up the eyes of you, and you look closely, the empty expanses that are because white or brilliant they are. Prosport the mission, a reaping, even now. So here it is, here's the translation. You make a you make not a lot, you make not a logical argument that is even now four months and the reaping comes. You look, I make a logical argument to you. You raise up your eyes and look closely at the empty expanses that are even now brilliant white forward to a reaping. There is a triple, triple, un, not entendre, but a, a triple meaning in this. It's beautiful. The Hebrew saying is this. Four months yet until the harvest is a procrastination. Okay, whether you knew this or not, or somebody told you this, but when it says, you say, four months until the harvest is a procrastination. In other words, I got four months to harvest, so I don't have to pick the weeds. I don't have to check the fields. I don't have to go out there. It's all cool. Hey, you know, whatever. You do it, right? The procrastination. The harvest isn't for another four months. We don't have to worry about that right now. Yet Jesus pushed back against the cultural phrase, insisting that his kingdom wasn't someday far off, but present and available now. And by the way, this is from um, a Jewish text about from a scene in 2022. Yes, sir. Well, I'm just kind of thinking of the context of the situation. You got this crowd of people coming back from the city. Jesus knows they're coming. The disciples are saying, this, this is a great time for lunch. And he's saying, no, no, we got people coming. This is what I'm about. Lunch can wait. I mean, this is the important stuff is what's coming up the road, not the fact that you guys went and brought me lunch. This is, you are precisely correct. And that's the point I meant by there's double, triple meaning in this. So, you know, okay, we're talking about food. Suddenly Jesus brings up the reaping and he makes a comment about, it says, he makes this comment. Um, Look closely at the empty expanses that are even now bringing white forward to a reaping. Okay, the disciples are standing here. Jesus is standing there. What's behind him? The whole town is coming behind him. They surely can hear them. The disciples are probably going like, you know, it, it, Jesus is, is basically <laughs> making a multiple meaning comment about this and it's beautiful because they're talking about him eating food he go, he transitions to reaping and uses a saying that says basically telling the disciples this is um he's telling the disciples you're procrastinating you need to open your eyes look to what's happening because the food i got came from this woman Right? That's the implication. And now the reap the fields for reaping, they're coming, right? And they don't have pitchforks, thank goodness. This, like I said, if you could put this into a, a video and do it right, it would be really kind of fun. But unfortunately, you know, we most of the time we're not perceptive enough, you know, unless we really get into the Greek that we can see, wow, this this is and there's some comedy. You know, there's comedy going on here. There's laughing. You know, Jesus is laughing. I can see him right now. Even now, the one who reaps draws a wage and harvests a crop for eternal life. So the sower and the reaper may be glad together. Okay. Let's see what it says in the Greek. Let's look at the King James. And he saith, and he that reapeth re receiveth wages and gathereth fruit unto life eternal, but both he that soweth and he that reapeth may rejoice together. The, the he reaping pay for service, Labanai. He takes hold of, and synagogue, he leads together. 
synagogue. Hmm. Harp and fruit, tour unto life, aneon, perpetual. In order that the scattering at the same place or time experience graciousness and he and the he reaping. So in Greek, this in the translation, the person reaping is paid for his service. He takes hold of and leads together fruit that reaped into eternal into life perpetual in order that the scattering, the sowing at the same place experience graciousness and the person reaping. Okay. You might ask yourself the question, who is sowing? Who sowed? The Samaritan woman. And what does Jesus expect them to do? Reap. And what did Jesus just tell them that the Samaritan woman's got? Yeah, well, yeah, life eternal, life perpetual, but the big deal, I think it's really interesting, is that she, you know, the, remember the Greek word for, you know, not, not really salvation, but charis, we call it, we call it grace, right? We translate it grace. To us, grace is the thing. But in the Greek world, grace just means you acknowledge a person. God acknowledges you in the terms of grace in that sense. So Jesus, Jesus said some really powerful stuff here. In other words, he just said that, how does he view this Samaritan woman? With grace. In other words, he sees her as his equal. Jesus basically said, she is my equal. She, matter of fact, Jesus passed the information to her, but she did what? She sowed. Right? And therefore, because she sowed, she, she's, a, she's scattering, she's sowing, she gets graciousness. And not only that, if you're reaping, you get the same. The, yeah, I think this, this is really some deep stuff that our author is giving us. You know, um, like I said, you, you gotta really see this in the thing, but here's the thing, unstated tells. This is a Greek argument that will give an unstated tells. Note the word usage. The basis for synagogue is synagi, to lead together. He just told he just told them he takes hold of and leads together fruit into life perpetual. Okay. Synagogue. That word, he did not call them to be fishers of men in John. But if you remember, in Matthew, I believe in Luke, he called them to be fishers of men, or maybe in Mark and Luke, Mark and Matthew. Anyway, he calls them to be fishers of men, and he used the term synagogue. In other words, they are to draw together people. So this is a direct implication back to that and also to the idea of the synagogue. In other words, Jesus just told them that who is in this, who is suddenly in this synagogue? The Samaritans. The Samaritans. Being led by a Samaritan woman. A, a, well, a sinful Samaritan woman, an outcast, you know, someone who has mm -hmm. led the life, you know, the people, the Pharisees were always criticizing Jesus for being with those kinds of people. There could be hope for all of us, right? This is astounding to me that, that you see a Samaritan woman leading the town into synagogue. And Jesus saying that she, because of it, has graciousness and life perpetual. And then he leaves the open question, so to speak. You know, the Logos to tell us here is that, um, okay, so... We have this, you guys, what is he going to expect the disciples to do? Reap. Reap. Now, Jesus may have to do all the reaping himself because these disciples need some help. But, they're th yeah, they're hungry. They want some food. I think it's funny because in this case, the word use is applied to farming instead of fishing. 
the reaper gains his pay, which is the same, if not more, than he reaped. In addition, there's a promise to the sower and also the reaper. That's what we talked about, right? Thus the saying, one sows and another reaps, is true. Um, now, you may say, why, why is this so important to Jesus? I think there's a lot of importance in this. Um, you know, Jesus has already gone beyond the normal bounds, all right? He told the Samaritan woman, where are you going to worship? Everywhere. Because, G because God is spirit and truth, right? And you are spirit, and therefore you worship God wherever you are. Period. That. That's what he said. Straight up. He also told her that she was riding the money when she said, hey, uh, we're looking for a Messiah. We're looking for the Christ. And he goes, huh, yeah, me. And she, did she believe it? She believed it so much that she went out. Talk about going outside of your cultural boundaries, right? She went to the marketplace. She told him, she comes back. And Jesus says, here is the true saying, one soweth, another reapeth. Okay, enter among the sign of reason, this, the logos, the logic argument, is not false. Better because other, another is the spirit of the scattering, and other or another, the reaping. Assigning a reason in this, in this, the logical argument, is not false. That one is the scattering, and another, the reaping. Jesus wanted to make sure that this was a very clear thing to his disciples. Now, whether they got it this time, now see, we only get one, right? We, we look, they don't have, in, uh, we wish they had endless paper. Remember, a cost of a sheet of paper in this time, this document probably cost at least $20,000 in equivalent money for John to write. And every time they recopied it, we're talking $20,000, right? So we're talking big money in the time. So we wish that we knew every story, every account about whatever. John picked the most important, poignant account within the context of the Logos to tell us that he wanted to present to us, and he gives it to us. So this didn't happen just one time, right? Hopefully the disciples, you know, they see it once, maybe get part of it, see it twice, a little bit more of it, see it the third time, the fourth time. I don't know how long it took these disciples to get it. How long does it take us to get it? Sometimes we live our whole life and we don't fully understand or get it, but yet we should. The point of Jesus is, is Nicodemus going to bring salvation to the people of Israel? He doesn't even understand about being born again of the Spirit, right? John. Is John bringing that salvation? John's a precursor. John is sowing. So because he's sowing, yeah, he has equivalency. But guess who is equal to John? Guess who is equal to the disciples? It's the outcast married woman who is basically one of the brightest people that we get in the whole of the Gospels, and we never give her enough credit. I think this person is a genius. I'd like to talk to her. She just seems like a really smart person, right? Um, there is a Tanakh allusion to Micah. And see, we have time to, to get to it. Uh, it's worth looking the whole thing, so maybe we'll finish this next uh, week. Listen to what the Lord says. Stand up and plead my case before the mountains. Let the hills hear what you have to say. Hear you mountains of the Lord's accusation. Listen, you everlasting foundation of the earth. The Lord has a case against his people. He is launching a charge against Israel. My people, what have I done to you? How have I burdened you? Answer me. I brought you out of Egypt to redeem you from the land of slavery. I sent Moses to lead you, also Aaron and Miriam. My people remember what Balak, king of Moab, plotted. And what Balaam, son of Beor, answered. Remember your journey from Shittim to Gilgal. That you may know the righteous acts of the Lord, with what with what shall I come before the Lord and bow down before the exalted God? I just run to the thing we can I, I want you to hit this 15. I think I got it marked. You will plant but not harvest. You will press olives but not use the oil. You will crush grapes but not drink the wine. 
we'll get we'll go back over this next week and see the context because the context is really important. Thank you, Father, for your word. We pray you look after us this week. And we pray. So I know I marked out the twentieth, but we are going to have class. Okay. Mom's the word.